Bringing Bring from the Acts of the Apostles. Yeah. They devote themselves to the Apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles all who believed were together and had all things in common they would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need day by day as they spent much time together in the temple they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts praising god and having the goodwill of all the people and day by day the lord added to their number those who were being saved just take a moment to allow the reading to um, settle, to perhaps reread parts of it in your, uh, from your paper. Be mindful of any words that jump out at you. Um, be attentive to anything that stands out. Lucas, I'm going to invite you to, to read the reading again. They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. All came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to the number of those who were being saved. Once again, if any words, any ideas or thoughts um, surface, if you have a pen and paper, you can jot them down. And our gospel is from John 20, verse 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. 
Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. And as we did with the first reading, just take a moment to allow the words to sink in, to be attentive to any phrases, any moments in that gospel which stand out for you. And I'll read it once more. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, in my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Once again, just take a few moments. Any thoughts, any words that stand out to you, just make note of them before we move on.
so with when we're at Bible and beer, um, it's a time for us to reflect on scripture, reflect on the word of God, um, to take some time using the readings that are coming up on the upcoming Sunday to understand them a little bit deeper. I know some of you are new with us this evening, so I just wanted to preface that. Um, in readings like this, being the second Sunday of Easter, they're packed full of so many images and information that it's important for us to unpack it step by step. Because the second Sunday of Easter is filled with so much imagery, so many key points that teach us um, about where we are in our Easter journey, but also where we are as a faith community, especially um, with, you know, the celebration of Divine Mercy Sunday, you know, which are based on these readings as well. But we're, we're going to look, as per usual, at what is going on in the scripture story. Um, you know, where, you know, with Divine Mercy, not so much to talk about Divine Mercy itself and the whole tradition, uh, but, to, to, but to look more intently at what is happening in the scripture passage, okay? Um, what we're seeing in the first reading and in the gospel is very much a mirror of the two. Um, often I've said in the past, um, and we've seen this most intently through Lent and then uh, now in Easter, and through the other times of the year, what we, the, the first reading and our gospel are often very much connected. Whereas the second reading, um, in, in this case from one of the letters, it, 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 just, it just helps us to, to reflect uh, specifically um, on a theme within the day. Now, in Lent, we listened a lot to the Old Testament prophets. And what we're going to see through Easter is our first reading is actually always from the book of Acts. That's something to point out. Because even though the book of Acts isn't dealing necessarily with um, Easter per se, like the whole Easter event, it's having to deal with the life, the new life of the Christian community after the resurrection. Okay, so the Acts of the Apostles picks up where our Gospels, specifically the Gospel of Luke, uh, finishes. Where Luke finishes, the book of Acts continues. Where the story is in Luke and the Gospels about the life of Jesus, the Acts of the Apostles is literally the life and times of the Apostles in their experience of living this new life in Jesus Christ. So that's important to, to, to understand because in these readings, what we're seeing in Acts is what was life like following Pentecost? Being in chapter two for the Acts of the Apostles today, um, this, this passage is talking about living the ideal of the Christian community following the moment of Pentecost. What we hear about on Pentecost Sunday, okay, when the Holy Spirit is given to the apostles um, in the traditional uh, timeline that we understand and we celebrate liturgically, this story follows immediately. So after they have been locked up in the room, after Jesus has ascended, and they are set free, if you will, and commissioned with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the life of the early Christian community is described here. So they're living kind of the ideal. They're seeing, we're seeing what was possible, um, what really stood out to, um, to understand what this com Christian community was all about. And there's three things that we hear about in this first reading, three very important things 
that Luke, the author of the Acts of the Apostles, uh, is trying to help us to remember. There's three things. It's about teaching, it's about solidarity with one another, and it's about prayer. Life for the early Christians is about teaching, solidarity, and prayer. First of all, teaching. We understand that they they would follow the teaching of the apostles, those that knew Jesus most intimately. The teaching of breaking open God's word through the scriptures, through the Old Testament, very similar to our experience of the story of Emmaus, where, where Jesus explains everything in scriptures, everything that had to happen. They were still new at this. They were trying to understand. They were trying to see, with a hindsight being 2020, what the whole experience of Jesus was about. For those who were new and added to their numbers, as we hear at, at Pentecost, um, this is their life in getting to know the experience. Um, maybe hindsight again, the, the experience of the Christian community and how it was shaping who they were to be. And really, this is kind of characterizing the life of the Christian community within a few years of Jesus's death and resurrection before any of the scriptures were actually uh, codified. And we spoke about that last month, about the timing of when, when, when the, the Gospels came to be, okay? Even before Mark wrote the first Gospel, or it was put down on paper, uh, 17 years, starting 17 years after Jesus' death, that's, this is the whole tradition that they were living by, that oral tradition, before the scriptures were beginning to, to come together. This was their life. The second thing, solidarity. It wasn't just a philosophy like some type of Christian socialism, but more it, living community was their response to their experience of God present among them. They lived in solidarity with each other. They sought to deepen an awareness of God's love, mercy, and forgiveness through the concrete expressions and the structures that they had um, experienced through the grace of God among them. So you see things like, as we hear in verse 25, they sold their possessions and goods. They distributed it to all as they had need. You know? One of those uh, perfect world scenarios, if you will, to help us to understand God working and God's love and grace working through us through charity. We're seeing so much of a, about that right now in the response for COVID-19. You know, we're not, we, we've said this before when we've reflected on this, the church isn't as present in this time of COVID-19 because we're not always at the forefront of the medical situation, maybe as in past pandemics in the Middle Ages. Um, but the values that we're seeing come to life here is very much rooted in this call for solidarity. So I think even though we might say, well, the church isn't present, we're, not, you know, we're doing things virtually among ourselves and so forth right now, yeah, that, that may be all we can do. But the witness that we're seeing in healthcare, in the social structure, trying to help people is really very much rooted in our Christian experience. That's something to remember. The third thing, prayer. It's important to remember that this early group of Christians don't really identify themselves as Christian yet. They're still Jews. And they're good Jews. They go to the temple. Okay, Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they didn't change the temple. They're still Jewish. They're still praying as good Jews. But they also broke bread at home. This is where we're starting to see 
the breaking of the bread taking on a very significant role in the life of that early Christian community. The Eucharist, the thanksgiving, that response to the awareness of God's grace in their life together. This is where we hear about it. This is before the persecutions. This is before the Christians had to go into hiding. What we're hearing is day by day, they spent much time together in the temple. So on Saturday, the Sabbath, and then on Sunday, the first day of the week, the day of the resurrection, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts. Their life, this glad and generous heart, some translations use the word sincerity of heart. This glad, generous heart, this singleness of heart. What this is calling forth in us, but also in them, is becoming one together. It was a recognition that they were being called together for more than just themselves. That's what the early Christian church was trying to recognize, how their life in Christ, in this experience of the risen Christ, was an experience of becoming more than just being themselves. The gospel, as the Acts of the Apostles that we hear about today, is life after Pentecost. We're seeing the contrast of the passage from John being life after the resurrection. Yes, the Acts of the Apostles also comes after the resurrection, but, this, but it's a significant moment later on as that early church comes together. John is saying, uh, the Gospel of John today is uh, really saying it's the first day of the week, which the translation is, it's really the night, it's really the night of the resurrection, okay? You have to remember, just like we, for those of you that joined us uh, last week when we reflected on um, John's gospel for Holy Thursday, John's gospel was written about 70 years after the fact. And he was writing to a community who is already aware of the experience of Jesus. Already aware of the experience of the resurrection and how that early church was already developing. That's why, as we said last time, uh, John's gospel is very theological. There's a lot of theological significance in what John is saying. And that's why we hear at the end, you know, there's many other signs that we could have written, written here, but this is the basic so you understand that Jesus is the Son of God. Like John is explaining himself. But there's so much in this gospel that is important for us in who we are in this first week of Easter. John is reminding the people who they are and what they are called to do. Some of our gospels were written for people that are, were beginning to understand who Jesus was, John is writing to, for a people who already understand the message and significance. What do we know about this group right after the resurrection? We know they were scared. We know from the other gospels that uh, the women went to the tomb in the morning, I don't want to say all hell broke loose, but all hell broke loose. <laughs> and they went back to tell the guys, you know, what was going on. And we know that they were a fearful bunch because they were afraid of the authorities. The body was gone. You know, what was, what was to happen? What were they going to do? Who stole the body? Did you steal the body? I didn't steal the body. Who stole the body? Thomas isn't around. Maybe Thomas stole the body. Instead, um, what the, the beginning of this passage is reminding us that Thomas is not there. 
they're not together. They're scattered. Okay. One of the 12 is missing. One of the 12 is dead. You know, um, somehow they found each other and went back to the room. You know, it's almost, you know, he's kind of scattered. He's missing. Maybe he went shopping to get some food. Maybe he's not isolating. We don't know where he is. But we do know the doors are locked. But that doesn't stop Jesus. The appearance of Jesus, this gift of peace, this gift of his spirit, and the mission to forgive are all bound together. We have to remember that the giving of peace and the call to forgive are very much at the root of what these scared individuals are called to now do. That's what we see when this passage begins. It goes a step further when a week later, they're gathered again. Now Thomas is there. Now the group is complete. It was a week later, as we hear, it was on the first day of the week, the day of the resurrection. So here they are a week later, again, on the first day of the week, when the community had traditionally started celebrating already the Lord's Supper. So it's significant that the Lord came to them on that first day of the week a second time. But we do hear the doors are, are closed. They haven't opened them up. Were they still afraid? We don't know. But we do hear, and John makes a point, saying the doors were shut. And even if others weren't going to get in, even if they didn't want to go out, Jesus was going to come in again. He brings peace to the whole group. A peace, again, peace be with you. That was needed to support a community of solidarity and of mission. In Evangelii Gaudium, the joy of the gospel, Pope Francis talks about closing our minds and our communities and the danger of not opening up. Even though the disciples were greeted by Jesus, even though a week before Jesus had appeared to them, they still had their doors closed. Francis, Pope Francis continues by saying, more than by fear of going astray, my hope is that we will be moved by the fear of remaining shut up within, structure, within structures, which give us a false sense of security within rules which make us harsh judges and within habits which make us feel safe. While at the door, people are starving and Jesus does not tire of saying to us, give them something to eat. In both moments of Jesus appearing to the apostles in the upper room, their doors were closed. They knew what happened that morning. The experience of peace was what they needed. And that experience of peace was the message that they needed to give. And John connects that with the experience 
of bringing forgiveness in the midst of that peace. As Pope Francis points out, pointed out in that passage, you know, rigid, rigid structures, rules, habits, retribution, they can make us feel safe, but they don't always bring us Christ's peace. We know Christ's peace only when we get caught up in that dynamic of an ever-expanding, forgiving love. And that's kind of the journey that we're called to deepen in the, these 50 days of Easter. The message of that, those two moments, Jesus came and appeared, breathed peace upon them, commissioned them to go, but they still kept their doors locked. It wasn't until they were together again they were together as a group and they've had time to allow that peace and that mission to settle in them. It's what had to happen for them. Not only did, and you think about this, this is the first time they're seeing Jesus after the resurrection. And they were scattered too. This is Jesus's first chance to bring them peace and to let them know the forgiveness for what they did. We hear in the, the Gospels um, and also the Acts, well, uh, in the Gospels, um, the continued stories of the appearances of Jesus before the ascension. And we hear those times, you know, Peter has to say three times, do you, do you love me? And says, Lord, I know, you know I love you. Why do you keep asking me this? Those three times of affirmation were to correct the three denials. To presume the disciples had it all together right after the Pentecost, after Jesus appears to them, I think that short changes our experience. So it's important for us to, to remember that as we continue in this time of Easter, we still continue to receive and accept the presence of Jesus to allow his peace to be a source of grace, to allow his forgiveness to be a source of grace, and to know that we're called then to leave our place, to leave our home, to leave where we're bound up together. And literally right now, how do we then become that source of peace for others and that source of forgiveness? All right. On the page that you have there, um, are the questions, and I'm going to copy them into the chat for you to have with you. I may do this a few times because once you get into small group, you may need them posted again. What did I do? Who did that? Um, so there's a few questions I'm gonna invite you guys to reflect on in small group. How does our first reading from Acts reflect your lived situation right now? Maybe how is it different? And I'm thinking your lived situation, you know, in and outside this element of isolation, I guess. Where is there room for you to grow? Second question, what's been going on in your house? Who is there with you? Is there fear? Is there isolation even within your own home with others? Is there doubt? How is Jesus finding a way in these days? In what ways do you need to hear 
peace be with you. Maybe your door is locked, even though we're in Easter, even though, you know, whatever. How is your door locked? How do you need to hear peace be with you? And what will it take for you to keep the doors unlocked and allow yourself to be sent?